Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software Gray Tech Group. You're invited to join our conversation to model the future of construction innovation and the digital transformation adventure of this great industry. My guest today is Todd Grossweiler. Todd has been with Allison Smith Company for almost 25 years, where he is currently an executive vice president. Todd graduated from Georgia Tech prior to beginning his career with Allison Smith. He continues to seek out ways to innovate through process, technology, and people, maintaining good relationships with both his internal teams and external customers is the foundation of his success. Todd believes that if you surround yourself with good people, then good things will happen. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thanks for having me, Todd. Yeah, absolutely. Always a pleasure to have a, another Todd on the, the podcast. <laughs> I love the line of surround yourself with good people and good things will happen. I, I more than agree with that for sure. Yeah. I've picked that up some time. I might've even thought about that in college and just chose to associate myself with people that I thought were good. And it, it's paid off to this point in my career. So yeah, <laughs> that's, it's a good, good, uh, good equation there. <laughs> How'd you pick construction to begin with? What appealed to you to, to bring you into this industry? So uh, as a degreed electrical engineer from Georgia Tech, I had absolutely zero idea that construction was an option. Um, I fell into it. Uh, somebody from Allison Smith called me up the week before I was graduating, asked me if I wanted an interview with the company. Um, he went through a whole sales pitch about what they do, asked me if I thought any of it sounded interested. And I chimed in with the next stupid words out of my mouth. Did you actually read my resume? <laughs> Luckily for me, the gentleman on the phone was witty and just comes back with, well, you know that V equals IR, right? Well, yeah, that sounds a lot. It's one of the first things they teach in electrical engineering. That's all you need to know. So I went through a few interviews. Uh, the final interview, Bob Allison, the son of the original Allison of Allison Smith, came to me and said, well, we'd like to offer you the job and want you to try it out for a few months. If you don't like it, write it off on your resume as a summer job. So this is almost 25 years later, it's the longest summer job I've ever had. There you go. There you go. What about it gripped you to, to stay in for 25 years? The uh, appeal to it, uh, it, it goes back to the people side. I, I like interacting with people of all kinds, different sorts. And um, the other side of it was the ability to deal with multiple different types of projects that could present problems that have to be solved. Hmm. And our mission statement here at Allison Smith is we build problem solvers. So it, it, it suited me very well and just, it kept it interesting all these years still. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So one of the things that Allison Smith, you guys have is a, truly a, a innovative, creative problem solving culture. In your view, what are some key ingredients for creating that culture within a construction company? Uh, it starts with finding the right people. Uh, but then it's empowering them to actually do something about it. Uh, we, we can tell them all, all day long that we, we build problem solvers, but if we don't give them an opportunity to do it, then we're falling short. So getting the people that have that kind of mindset already, and we found them both from engineering schools and, and from the field, uh, finding people that have that desire to tackle a problem, uh, overcome it, or make it better uh, mm -hmm. is kind of how we build our people. Yeah. So to kind of double click on that, how do you then embed the innovation into the company's DNA so that it's, it's really just becomes second nature. It's every part of every single process rather than these one-off initiatives or, oh, that's just, you know, the, the chief innovation officer's job and it's, it's not my responsibility. It's, it's over there. How do you create that, that DNA environment? You don't do it in a vacuum. So we, we openly collaborate with all of our different teams. We share our successes uh, it, and celebrate them. So having that kind of openness about what each other is doing and allowing people to be you know celebrated for their successes, I think helps embed that into your DNA. Mm. It's the culture side of things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How do you, so the other kind of, side of the coin on the innovation coin is the failure aspect and, and learning from that. How do you guys handle talking about failure or, you know, uh, 
learning from it? Uh, how does that work? Uh, well, failure is kind of like Fight Club. We don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it, it's it's a great question. Um, you, you can't expect to try something new without having some misses. So uh, coming back to the type of people that we employ, both from college and from the field that have a lot of experiences and sharing those different experiences together to when something does go wrong, uh, do a root cause analysis of it and coming back to figure out, all right, well, th this, this went wrong. What went wrong? How can we make it better to avoid it going wrong? Or sometimes maybe this isn't the right path to continue down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you see people struggle with being open to talk about the, the learnings from something that, you know, failure is a bad word. So maybe it's just a learning experience of this didn't meet expectations or, you know, we, we thought it was going to do this and ended up over here on left field. Uh, do you find people willing to, to share those experiences or is it a, uh, let's kind of push that over to the side and, and, and not really focus on that? Yeah, I, I think it's in most people's nature to want to avoid the difficult conversations. Sure. So the approach that we take to getting around those really helps, you know, sharing some of maybe my failures if I'm, or misses, call it. There you go. I like that. <laughs> so uh, that sharing those things with the people we're talking about or talking to and over, you know, what went wrong? How did it happen? Not, not looking to point fingers, but find what the, what the issue is and, and how we can fix it or make it better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another kind of aspect of that is with the, the entrepreneurial mindset, what's the significance of that in the construction industry for you? And then what are some strategies that you've implemented to, to really empower your employees to think and act like an entrepreneur? Uh, it's huge for me and it's huge for Allison Smith uh, going way back in the time machine again, when, when I was interviewing and, and talking to Bob Allison about working for the company, he mm -hmm. described project managers at Allison Smith as a bunch of entrepreneurs running their own books of business under the umbrella of the company. Um, that was attractive to me. Um, so when we talk to our people that were either looking to hire in that position or move into a position like project manager or a production kind of role, we we give them the same spiel and the same encouragement to go out and manage their book of business, their relationships, um, their individual successes ultimately become the company successes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of in that vein, have you uh, adopted or, or diversified your, your services in response to the, the changing client needs? And maybe can you, you share an example of listening to that, that client feedback that that led to a shift in your, your innovation or your approach? Sure. I, I'll say we, we adapt all the time. Um, we diversify some of the time, uh, from a diversification standpoint, uh, not to necessarily one particular client, but what the general market was doing and schedules combined with, uh, new people coming into the labor force that aren't as skilled as the previous generation or have more to learn. I'll say they, their potentials there, but they're not equally as skilled when they first start. Mm -hmm. um, so prefabrication was one of those things that we went into and, you know, had our growing pains there too, having to get buy off from all the people in the field that thought we were stealing their jobs uh, to realize that we're actually successfully getting more work because we're able to do that. And we're able to make their jobs of managing the men and women in the field easier by giving them more kind of Ikea style assembly instructions for portions of the work, helping them with the planning side, which is where the wedges come. Mm -hmm. So you bring up prefab. That's, that's one of my favorite topics to, to dive into. Uh, how did you go about that, that process uh, and really trying to change and uh, develop essentially a new culture to really embrace the the prefab and then overcome the uh, objections that I'm sure you, you had on, uh, you, you know, you were just laying some of them out. Uh, how'd you overcome those objections to communicate? This isn't 
a scary thing. This is actually a, a really cool and exciting thing that's a great growth opportunity for all of us. It certainly was a sales effort, um, for sure. Uh, one of the first things I always challenge anybody that's struggling with prefab about is chances are they're already doing it. They're just not calling it that. And it, it may be mm. on-site prefabrication and on off-site prefabrication, but we have plenty of skilled tradesmen out there that are setting up stations and prefabbing stuff on site. So starting with that and then convincing them of the benefits of moving some of that same activity into a more controlled environment uh, made it easier. Mm -hmm. Still was difficult. There were still some. Um, the next thing is picking the the people to test it on first. Like we didn't go whole hog. We we started with individual projects and maybe some people that were a little more stubborn about it and convinced them that it was a good thing. And once the difficult individual said, this is great, like it was a lot easier to get other people to come on board. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You get that naysayer to uh, turn around and that's a, that's a pretty powerful argument to, to everybody. It's kind of sitting in the middle. If that guy can do it, then anybody else can do it too. What kind of timeline was that evolution of, of really developing? Because you guys have a, a really cool prefab facility there. Well, what what kind of timeline was that to to really uh, you know start the journey and then start seeing the payoff on the the backside? Uh, it was, I'd say, I would categorize it in years. Um, you know, we started the offsite prefabrication in our old office location in the back in the warehouse with a couple tables. So that was probably 12 years ago that we started that hmm. uh, and slowly grew that. When we moved into the new building that we're currently in, we reserved an entire room in the warehouse um, and it continued to grow and we would spill out into the warehouse. Uh, so it, it was positively building upon itself. And then we had an opportunity to lease the building across the parking lot from us. So we took 25,000 square feet out of that building and have the current prefab shop that we have today. So, and we're still continuing to, you know, make modifications and improvements to that space as it is. Our prefab manager, I think is on, you know, version 4.0 of the shop layout at this point. He's, constantly looking for ways to improve the workflow through the prefab shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Where do you see the the future of prefab and then kind of going down into to modular construction? Where, where do you see that evolving and what role does that play in the broader construction industry? Well, I, I think broader construction, if not everyone's doing prefab right now, they will be. Um, if they're not doing it now, they should be. <laughs> Clear benefits to it. Um, and I'll, prefab is a an easier investment than modular construction. Still requires some space to do it, or a willingness to reach out to vendors that might be able to help with some of the things you can't immediately do yourselves while you work through how you're going to grow your prefab group or department. Uh, modular construction. A much larger capital investment, um, a much larger space investment um, to go along with that. And outside of the additional level of expertise and coordination required, it's a bigger sales effort to get customers up front and early to start looking to put modular items into their designs. Mm-hmm. What do you see as the the first step? If somebody's looking at coming into this space, what's the first step that they should really consider taking and, and implementing? Um, I, I would say the, the first step is finding uh, a champion in your field to help lead the prefab effort. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, people can probably be successful bringing somebody in that's had prefab experience from somewhere else. But I feel like you'll have much more success taking 
an already known resource from within your field leadership force mm. and turning them into your prefab manager. Mm. That's interesting. The taking the internal resource. Yeah. I like that. Uh, so that kind of goes dovetails nicely into where I was going, uh, for the next little portion here, uh, how do you maintain a strong collaborative relationship between field workers and the, the office staff to, to really have that tight knit bond that so often at most companies there, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we expect our office staff, uh, mainly our project managers, to be actively involved in visiting and talking to the field. Our executive leadership group still makes you know periodic visits to a bunch of our different job sites, so we're staying engaged with the field too. Um, and we have employee appreciation events are another thing that, that's actually one of my favorite things we do. Um, every spring we have a employee appreciation picnic where we invite every single employee from the company, both the office and the field and their families to a venue somewhere. And we have a chance to play games, break bread, have conversations, meet kids, meet wives, and it, it helps, I guess, solidify that bond. Yeah, that's awesome. Are there other tools or, or processes that you've seen that have been really particularly effective in, in bridging the, the communication gaps between field and office? Uh, depending on how comfortable your field is with technology, there are some things that on the technology side that have been beneficial, uh, whether it's Teams or uh, Zoom or whatever. When you can't be physically present, still having some face-to-face -face time with some of the, the field leadership helps out. Uh, we've ramped up social media efforts to help get you know information out to the field uh, from a company-wide perspective, but individually, it, it's getting the one-on-one -on -one FaceTimes the the biggest thing. I talk about that with our office staff too. Um, and when COVID hit, we all had to adapt, mm -hmm. and the ad adaptation that everybody went to is how do how do you effectively work from home? if that's not what your job requires. <laughs> so we it, we did it. It worked out for a while. And then we came out of COVID. And, you know, some people were wondering about how much they could work from home. New people were looking to hire. Like, what's your work from home policy? Mm -hmm. And we came down to the fact that we don't really have a work from home policy. And I tell anybody that will listen to me, one of the best things about coming into an office or going to a job site is the accidental collaboration that will occur. Mm -hmm. You'll be walking by somebody huddled around a table talking about an issue they're having on a project. And you may have dealt with that same issue already and say, oh, this is how we handle it. Or, nah, you know, I don't know, but I'm interested in what this issue is. Let's go find Scott over here. I think he dealt something like this. So you miss out on those opportunities when you're not getting out there physically present. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I think those, those accidental collaborations, as you, you called it, uh, that's a, a huge benefit of, of being in the same space. And it, it's much harder to uh, create anything remotely similar. You can't recreate that in the, the remote digital space. You can have some good collaboration time periods, but it's, it's whoever's on the phone. You, you don't have those accidental bump-ins and the relationship building uh, is a lot trickier uh, when it's all remote, for sure. On the uh, trying to bring in new people into the industry, what initiatives or, or strategies have you guys put in place to, you know, uh, demonstrate that this is a, a really exciting industry and to make it appealing to the next generation of Allison Smith workers? From a office employee standpoint, we over the last couple of years, we have really wrapped up our internship program uh, and, and had some success. Uh, you know, we actually hired two people out of this past internship program as full-time employees. The year prior to that, we hired one full-time resource out of that. Uh, but in, in addition to having success hiring people, it's also 
a good marketing tool. Not everybody that comes to work here as an intern will be hired as a full-time employee, but they'll get to figure out some more about what we do, hopefully talk amongst their peers about the positive things in construction, even if it's not what ultimately is best for them. But if, if we present a, a good experience and show them the opportunities and the interesting things that happen all about construction, hopefully they're they're telling their peers back at school that. Mm -hmm. uh, from a field standpoint, uh, we're struggling like everybody else, but we have, uh, you know, ramped up our marketing and recruiting efforts. Uh, the, the thing we find most effective is the word of mouth from actual current employees. You know, they, they know somebody that knows somebody, and the, those are the ones that we generally retain for long periods of time. And, you know, most people that we hire, I hope, will think that this will be the last place they need to work um, ever and just retire one day. Uh, that's not realistic to think that everybody's going to come in that way. But we do have a lot of long tenured people. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm 25 years. Uh, the One of the first electricians I met when I came to work here works in our prefab shop as one of the shop supervisors. He has been here 38 years, uh, and we have a, a long history of people from the office and from the field that retire from Allison Smith. And that, that's, I think, one of our biggest testaments to our success over the last 80 years. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that speaks volume that you have uh, a lot of people that are long tenured at Allison Smith. It's obviously a, a great place to be around. What does the the good experience in construction look like to help increase that that word of mouth ability? Uh, well, the biggest thing I think about construction is there are more opportunities for success in construction, regardless of where you start, than any other mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a degreed engineer from Georgia Tech, and I'm an executive at my company now, but uh, not too long ago, our former CEO that retired just a couple years ago, he started as an apprentice electrician in the field for Allison Smith and retired as the CEO of Allison Smith. There's plenty of other stories of success like that in the construction industry. I know specifically in the electrical, but I was sure of the other trades as well. People that start working in the field, proving themselves as problem solvers, productive people, leaders that end up going from an apprentice to an owner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the really cool and unique things about the construction industry is that when and it's, it's also kind of a, a hard aspect of, of charting your your career path when you come into construction because it's it's not a linear path at all. You could you come in no matter where you come into the the industry and your paths are, you know, a hundred different options that, that could be in front of you from the, you know, what you just laid out of the uh, apprentice all the way up to, to CEO. That's a, it's a big swing and, and a lot of variations to, to get there. Um, with all the potential and all the opportunities, one of the things that, that fascinates me is why is that message not getting out? to people outside of the, the construction industry. It seems to be this, you know, just really well-kept secret that's within the construction space. Why do you think that there is that hurdle of communicating that out to people that don't really look at construction as one of their, their first paths? The, we are overcome by everybody else's marketing. And, and <laughs> I, I remember too, you know, and when I was, Growing up, going to high school, it was, hey, you finish high school, you go to college, you get a degree, maybe you get a master's degree, you get a good job. Mm -hmm. um, there was information about trades when I was going through high school, but it wasn't as broadcast as all of the other opportunities for somebody getting a four-year college degree or more. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're still overcoming that. You know, I love people like Mike Rowe um, that are out there championing the trades and we're trying to do the same. So as an industry, we need to do a better job. I think we're getting better, 
um, but there's a lot of catching up we have to do. Mm-hmm. Now the other thing, uh, and I, I used this at a conference I was speaking at, uh, at one point. We need to bring sexy back. You know, Justin Timberlake should have our theme song, and we'll we'll bring sexy back into the construction industry because there really are a lot of cool things happening in construction. You know, the seeing a project from its infancy to its completion and driving by it and telling your family like, yeah, daddy worked on that building over there. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, there sure. are a lot more interesting technologies coming into the construction space. So attracting some of the younger generation, uh, including some of that into the marketing we're doing, opportunities to work with these neat and interesting tools um, could help bring some people in. Um, although we still need plenty of people that can turn a screwdriver and strip some wire too. Yeah. Uh, what kind of picture do you think we, we need to paint? What do you see resonating with people that are coming into the industry of what's, what's gripping them for construction? Uh, you know, the, and this goes back to finding the right person again, not, not everybody's meant for college. Uh, finding those people that, and convincing their parents more like more than likely that the opportunities in the trades are great, um, particularly from a income versus debt standpoint. When you start mm-hmm. stacking on college debt, uh, and you know you, you want we want the right kind of people that they they like work over their hands. Yeah, they're Pick the kid that likes taking apart his things and putting them back together, even if they don't work a game while they put them back together. Like those are the kids we want coming into the trades. The yeah. not afraid to break something, kids. I like it. I like it. Shifting as we start to land the plane, shifting back into technology. What do you see as an important trend for kind of this year and and moving out over the the next several years? Uh, streamlining the ability to, uh, I guess, vet technology. There is an awful lot of construction technology out there. Uh, and some of that is the next perfect technology for your company, but you've got to sort through all the rest of it to find it. <laughs> uh, making that easier for people, I think would be great. And, you know, What's best for my company technology wise might not be best for the next company over there. So there, there's a lot of value to be found out there helping the end user find the values The I think the biggest key in the technology side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's, you nailed it when you said what's best for me might not be best for the next guy that keeping up with the Joneses is, is not helpful in the technology adoption rate. Cause there's, so many different variables uh, at different companies that from the, the culture to what else do you have in your, your tech stack to your uh, uh, maturity in like, if you're coming into to prefab somebody that's been doing it for years and years and years and, and has a, a huge uh, prefab shop is going to be at a very different place in their tech stack than somebody that's just starting. And you can't try to make that leap all in, in one, uh, one fell swoop, but yeah, no, I think that's huge. Yeah, I've I've talked about this before too. Like people ask about innovation, like, you know, what are you doing that's innovative? And I said, mm-hmm. well, it it depends on if you want me to compare me to me or me to somebody else. And I challenge people, don't compare your innovation to somebody else. You might be doing something for your company that's the first time you've ever done it and it's very innovative. You know, company B over here has been doing that for years. So it's it's not new or innovative for them, but that doesn't mean it's not innovative for you. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, I I might steal that. I'll I'll give you credit. Don't worry. (laughs) But that's a great line. It's a great line. What do you see as the the next step in the industrialization of construction at large? Uh, I'm really curious about robotics um, coming into prefab and and modular construction more. Uh, Things are getting close. Um, I know for the mechanical and plumbing trades, they're further along and that kind of stuff. They were, of course, they've always been further along in prefab than electrical was. We're we're catching up, but we have a lot more widgets to deal with than they do. Uh, but I, I I really think there'll be some 
pretty cool stuff happening um, throughout all trades along that lines. Yeah. Nice. nice. Uh, well, how do people find out more information and connect with you? Well, they uh, can certainly find our website at uh, allisonsmith.com. Uh, my information is available on there. Uh, certain, feel free to reach out. They can also find me on LinkedIn um, or some of my other social media platforms. I do have a we have an Allison Smith account, but I have personal accounts too. And if you do enough searching on the internet, you might find some Christmas videos with me in an elf costume. That's a great tease for somebody to <laughs> to go around and do some detective work there. <laughs> Love that. Uh, so final question for you. If I could give you all power, you could snap your fingers and innovate one thing in construction. What would you pick to innovate? Uh, and this might not be strategy, but communication. <laughs> okay. How uh, would you I, innovate communication? Yeah, I, I'm amazed um, how many issues that occur happen because of a, a lack of good communication. There's information mm -hmm. missing. Um, people don't know who to talk to or find some other hurdles that they can't overcome when communicating. So I, I don't think it would be difficult to innovate communication, uh, but I say that it requires people to take, make the effort. And if somebody falls short in, you know, you are the weakest link kind of thing, that's, if they're the weak link in the chain, they can take the whole process down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, I was, as you were talking, I was thinking that the, one of the hardest hurdles there is taking the time to slow down to actually communicate correctly. We're all moving so fast and getting inundated between emails and texts and, uh, you know, chats and slacks and all, all this incoming at us that it, in order to really communicate well, we can't just be totally reactive every single time. We have to slow it down and kind of take a breath and think and really focus active in and, and communicate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But active listening is a, is a skill that nobody practices right now. That's a, no. that's a hard thing. <laughs> uh, well, Todd, thanks so much for taking the time and, and coming on. There's a whole lot more rabbit trails that we could have gone down. Uh, so looking forward to, to future conversations there to, to yeah, dive into yeah. to more for sure. Always enjoy talking to another Todd. Likewise, likewise. <laughs>